Take your Bible, let's go back to Ephesians, if you would, Ephesians chapter 5, and let's, let's just touch on this again. Um, let's, let's look at chapter 6 real quick, and we'll get, the, um, we'll get more context into what Christ is saying through the Apostle Paul to his church there are rules and guidelines to live by when we don't live by them remember the story of of um, esther in the book of esther when ahasuerus the king gave his ring of authority to haman who is the devil you remember, the Bible says the city was perplexed. That means chaos. They didn't understand what, there was no order to what was going on. Ahasuerus had given his authority to the wrong one, the one who will, which is going on in Kenya right now. There are people out there in the streets stirring up the word that uh, this senator we were listening to Friday, the word he said was hustlers. And he said, the hustlers are hustling. And what that means is, those people, that, like I said, those people in Kenya will do, will do things for money because they just don't have money. And anybody that pays people and tells them, I want you to go out and stir up people against this candidate, and I want you to stir up people for this candidate. And it doesn't matter what they believe in. They got money and they're going to do what they're told. And they, it's just chaos everywhere. Um, just pray for them. Pray for Kenya. Well, it's that way. When you don't follow the order of God, it's chaos. I've been there. I wandered in that wilderness, and I know what that's like. And it's death, it is, it's death. So, when Ahasuerus took the ring off of Haman, hung Haman, set the Jews on high, set Morde as Mordecai on high. Mordecai is Christ, because he was brought in riding on a white horse, brought in in glory, to honor him. He's a picture of Christ. And he's the one who tells Esther, do you think that your head won't hang too just because you're the queen's wife or the king's wife? Do you think that you won't hang because you're, you're a Jew just like everybody else of us? You're a Jew. And Haman, uh, Mordecai said, Haman, do what you want to the Jews and the Jews are going to hang. You're going to hang with them. So that's when Esther got bold and she went to king, the king of Ahasuerus and said, let's turn this thing around. Haman's a bad guy. He's trying to kill my people. He's going to kill me. Your, your wife, he's going to kill me. Then the king goes out mad, take a breath, comes back in. He sees Haman pretty much laying on Esther. Hey, what, you going to force my wife in front of me too? Guards! Boy, guards came running in, grabbed him, took that ring off of him. Give me that ring. He then gave that ring to Mordecai. The Bible says the city rejoiced. Look at the difference it makes when you follow authority. You work where, JR? Hardee's. Hardee's is probably the least visited restaurant in America. They got good food. You just never see anybody there. Except old people with coffee. But they've got books, don't they? What are those books for? Tell you what to do, when to do it, how to do it, and what not to do. So he got the job baking the biscuits. Hardy's biscuits are better than McDonald's biscuits, I tell you that. 
right off the bat. Okay? Amen. All us old people. Amen. Okay? There's a trick to it. You learned it, didn't you? It's in the book. The book, and it probably has pictures in it, right? See, I'm pretty smart here. I worked at McDonald's two days. I'm smart. And what I mean, they had to train me just to cook a hamburger, a stinking hamburger. And I had this prissy gal that I went to college with, and uh, she was real pushy. And she's not doing it right. Well, I wasn't. But back then, they didn't have the pull-down grill. They got the open grill, and you had to sear them all. And you had to salt them all, and there was a way to do it. And if you didn't do it right, you got fired. I guess I got fired. I don't know. I just quit. It didn't show up. But anyway, there's rules. Even for a Hardee's biscuit, there's rules. If you, don't, if you don't follow the rules, Hardee's puts out a bad biscuit, and it hurts their business, and they fire people all the time, don't they? They fire especially young people all the time because young people do not ever want to follow rules. And um, I know what that's like. I Believe it or not, my worst rebellious streak was not when I was at home. It was when I was in Bible college, my third year. Man, I was rebellious. It is because I switched schools and I went to a more strict school and I did not like their rules. And I almost got, they give out demerits. And I almost got, Melissa, enough demerits to earn a trip home forever. Almost. My wife will tell you, man, I was, I did not like it. So I ran into her arms and got married. Life has been much sweeter, amen. But it's rules. Look at chapter 6, verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. Now, when the parents don't obey authority... How is it you can expect your children to obey authority? If the parents won't do it, you're not going to make your kids do it. Parents will say, if I catch you kids smoking, I'm going to tear your eye off. I don't ever want you catching one of these. And it's ridiculous. If I ever, you got a beer in his hand, if I ever catch you drinking my beer, I'm going to tear your eye off. Well, why are you drinking it? If I'm 12 years old and can't drink it, you're 40, how come you can drink it? I can't. What's the difference? What does 21 make to where alcohol now is good for you? It ain't. People don't follow the rules. And when you, like I said, when you're an adult and you don't follow the rules, children won't either. Children obey your parents and the Lord for this is right. Now, I will give you some exceptions. And this applies also in government. You will never hear anarchy from me. Ever. I am not one of these right-wing, so-called Christian anarchists that says, Our, because Joe Biden's the president, I don't have to do what the government says. Yeah, you do. You're, under, you're not under the president, you're under a constitution. That's a difference. You're under a, a guideline of rules for our country. Now, if the government doesn't obey the rules, that does not legitimize your rebellion. It doesn't. Unless the government forces you to do that which God specifically commanded you not to do or vice versa. For instance, China has a one baby policy, one child policy only. And if you, it is because they have over one billion people in their population, like India. Only China's got more land. But they are a communist nation, which means a totalitarian state, and you do not get freedom of speech. You do not get freedom to express yourself politically the way you want, or even religiously. There are so called Christian churches in China. But the pastors are approved by the government and their sermons must be approved by a government censor before they can be preached. Uh-uh. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. 
in the Bible, the prophet spoke even to the king or even against the king. Now, the king may have had the prophet's head cut off, or he may have hung him, or he may have put him down in a dungeon until he'd like Jeremiah. There may be a, a price to pay, but the prophet spoke against the king. The prophet was the word of God, and the word of God is always ahead of any king or any state government or authority. And so if children are in a situation where they're being forced by someone who is in authority over them in a home to do that which is not right, they have a right. He says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. If that parent is following the Lord's rules, even if that parent is lost, parents can be decent parents even if they're not saved. They can be somewhat decent. They can say, that's wrong, you're not doing this, you're not listening to that music, you're not running around with these people. Yeah, parents do that all the time. Not as much as it used to, but that still happens. And so as long as that home authority does not force you. Now, I've told you there's somebody in our church that is in a very, very deep, deep situation. And I will just say that it is a situation of child molestation. And the child reached out and notified me of the situation. I'm a mandatory reporter. I called it in. I filled out a report. And I was, I was glad to get a phone call 15 minutes after I sent the report in from an investigator saying, where's the child? Where's this guy? And he went out right then. And buddy, I'm telling you what, that shook me. But that child does not have to sit and let that man force her. Amen. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother. Now, I've had a lot of people ask me about this. I remember when the Crumb brothers were here, before their parents got saved, they had a lot of conflict. They were living at home. They were above 18, and they were out earning good money, uh, but their mom and dad weren't good with money, and so they often borrowed from their boys, and that wasn't right. And <clears throat> there was conflict in the home. And they came to me and asked me, what, what should we do? We're told in the Bible to honor our father and mother. And I, I told them, I said, you are, as long as you are in their house, you are, you are still under their rule. But you're 18. Legally, you are not subject to them legally. Now you can vote. Now you can sign contracts. Now you can play the lottery or whatever. You, you can't drink yet, but... You can sign a rental contract. Or what, you can move out. You can move out. And I said, it may be a situation where you, can, you have to honor your parents from a distance. If there is that conflict. And sure enough, they did. They moved out. And that eased up that whole situation so much that their dad got saved before he died and their mom got saved. Later, after uh, Keith died. But they had to move out to ease up that conflict so that mom and dad are not at them every day. They're not at their mom and dad every day, arguing, fighting, going on. They moved out, and all that just kind of went away. And that made, the Bible teaches us in so many places. Everybody listen to this. The Bible teaches in so many places how to handle conflicts and disagreements when Abraham and Lot's herdsmen strove together what did Abraham do he advised Lot let's separate you t you pick you go first I'll give you first pick of anything you want now Abraham did not have to do that 
But God said, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And after he gave Lot his first choice, and Lot chose the well-watered plains of Sodom, God told Abram, Now look northward, southward, eastward, and westward, uh, westward. All that thine eyes look upon, I shall give unto thee. Which is the whole earth. Where does north end? Where does south end? Where does east and west end? It's the entire world. Jesus was speaking of Abram in that phrase, The meek shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And Abram showed meekness, and he said, we need to separate. Because we can't have everybody in Sodom see us fighting, hear us trying to serve God, and them fighting each other. I used to, in my youth, I used to disagree with denominations. Oh, they're all bad, oh, we don't need them, we all need to get together. And I grew up. And I'm getting older by the day, and I'm getting more stuck in my ways. And I see that now. I see that some people just don't agree with everything you say on the Bible. And so they go to this church over here, or they go to that church over there. That fellow that came in this morning, nice, nice man. He may not agree with everything I say. Uh, he goes to a different church. That's his church. He's been there for years. And, uh, but he wanted to come over here and hear us, you know, see us and, and uh, hear me preach and so on and bless his heart. But he don't, if, if he don't agree with everything I say and he can't deal with it, he can't let it go, the best thing to do is separate. There is cases for biblical separation. When you are hooked up or yoked unequally. Uh, and that's uh, 2 Corinthians 6 and you can look into that. But anyway... Uh, separation when Paul and John Mark got into it in the book of Acts Paul didn't want did not want John Mark going with him on the second missionary journey because John Mark fell out because he couldn't keep up with Paul on the first missionary journey and the Bible says that Paul got so hot and got so mad that I mean it was a heated argument between them Paul was a hothead you you can see that in his nature and Paul just said you're not going with me I mean they're yelling at each other Barnabas, whose name means son, bar, son of consolation. He is a consoling type fellow. He takes John, he gets John Mark. John, come over here. He said, I'm going on a missionary journey too, but I'm not going where Paul's going. We're, we're, we're splitting up to cover more ground. Tell you what, won't you go with me? Luke then went with Paul. Luke then writes the Gospel of Luke. Luke then writes the book of Acts. John Mark is who? Mark, the author of the second gospel. There would not have been a second gospel written by Mark had Paul and Mark kept going at each other. Mark probably would have just pulled out and said, I ain't doing this. It took a man to come over, separate them and say, Let's not do this. Okay? Um, Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. And father, ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. Boy, I tell you what, I've, had, I've done that one. Not only as a parent of children, but a parent of adults. I have provoked my children to wrath and was ignorant about it. Wrong. Should have never done it. it. It could disqualify me as a bishop because my obligation is to rule my family well. That means do a good job with it. Don't, don't mess it up. Uh, and then he says, um, five, verse 5, Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh. With fear, he did not say slaves. He did not say slaves. Uh, John MacArthur is rewriting the New American Standard Bible to make all the word servants say slaves. He's an idiot. He is. He said servants. You know what a servant is? It's a kid that works at Hardee's. That's what he is. He serves a boss there. He does what he's told. He's not a slave. He can quit anytime he wants. He can go home at the end of the day and he gets paid for it. He's not in bondage. He is a free servant. But he is obligated 
uh, I'm obligated, people who work for somebody, Matthew's obligated to obey his boss. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters. And if you say, well, they're not saved, who cares? Can they fire you? Yes. So, do what they say. Unless they try to provoke you to do that which is not right. In other words, hey, um, why, don't you, uh, why don't you jack your time up a little bit? Because we got extra money to pay out. Why don't you just, instead of putting eight hours down, put ten hours down. You didn't work ten hours, you worked eight. Don't put ten hours down. That's lying, cheating. And God said, provide things honest in the sight of all men. So anyway, so that's the, that's the context of it. There has to be somebody who is in charge in every realm. I'm getting a ring here. And in every situation. So now, back to Ephesians 5, very quickly. Verse 22, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, and he was Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be under their own husbands and everything. And I got to where, I, years ago, I changed my wedding uh, deal that I did when I married people. I found one on the internet I really liked. I liked the language of it. And I added scriptures. I added these scriptures to it. And anytime I marry somebody, I don't care who it is, I don't care if they go, don't go to church here, I don't care if they're lost, doesn't matter. They're going to hear from God if they ask me to marry them. And it ain't, nobody's asked me to marry them in a long time. So anyway, that's the context of it. Now, look up on the screen. Turn to Malachi chapter 2. And I'll explain what I think is the context of this. Is speaking of Judah... Okay, not Courtney's baby, not Juju, but Judah, the man Judah. And when he says, Judah hath dealt treacherously. Now, what did Judah do? Judah had a son. And the son, I think, died. He had a second son, and he was married to Tamar. And because he didn't do right, God killed him. So now Tamar is the wife of the sons of Judah, but she has no children. And her second husband refused to give her a child. That's why God killed him. He refused. So Tamar went to Judah and said, What are you going to do for me? Even if you have another child now, according to the law, Tamar was still married into that family. She could not go out. And she tells Judah, Even if you... Have a child now. I have to wait 20 some odd years. I'll be an old woman by the time he grows up. So what are you going to do for me? I have nobody to live with, nothing to live on. Women didn't have it good back then. So she's mad at Judah. So what she did was she dressed up like a harlot probably covered her face judah came into town saw her and he paid her and he went in unto her and I'm, i don't know if i'm getting the story quite right but he left pieces of his clothing or something like that with her as like a token that he was going to pay her or something like that well, she ends up pregnant. So here's what Judah does. Judah found out she was pregnant. He didn't know at that time that that was his child. So he drags her out in the street like a whore, like they did 
the woman they caught in adultery with Jesus. Drags her out in the street. Judah's going to make a big example. Look at this. She's my daughter-in-law. Look at her. She's pregnant. They don't know who the man is. She's run off, played the whore. I'm going to, I'm going to have her stoned and killed. I'm going to, and he's crying like that, and he's demanding, tell us who the father of this child is. And she raised up, and she said, whoever owns his clothing right here. And Judah went. <laughs> she gave birth. The twin Zara and Zara his hand came out of the womb and they tied a red cord around his hand because he technically was the firstborn but he drew his hand back and Perez came out and they call him Perez because that's a Hebrew word for breach Perez the line of Jesus came through Perez, not Zara. Okay? But they were the sons of Judah. Now, now I've explained that. That's the context, I think, of what it's speaking about here. Look at, follow with me now. It, and it involves marriage, adultery, infidelity, not doing right. Judah hath dealt treacherously. And an abomination is committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah hath profaned the holiness of the Lord which he loved. Sounds like us. We love the Lord. There's no doubt about it. But every now and then we do something stupid or we do something wrong. And it profanes the holiness of the Lord. And hath married the daughter of a strange God. It's Tamar. The Lord will cut off the man that doeth this, the master and the scholar, out of the tabernacles of Jacob, and him that offereth an offering unto the Lord of hosts. And now he's speaking, and he says, verse 13, And this have you done again, covering the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping, and with crying out, insomuch that he regardeth not the offering anymore, or receive it with good will at your hand so he's profaned the holiness of the lord um let's see here the lord will cut off the man that doeth this this you've done again covering the altar of the lord with tears and weeping and crying out but there's no offering they're putting on a show of repentance but no fruit of repentance that's kind of what i get out of this now look at verse 14 Yet you say, wherefore, which means how? how, how are we doing this? Malachi explains, because the Lord has been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth. Against whom thou hast dealt treacherously. Judah already had a wife. From which those two sons came forth. But then he goes into town by himself. And sees Tamar dressed like a harlot. And it gets him. And he goes in. And so now, he dealt treacherously against the wife of his youth, yet is she thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. I think it follows the law. I'm not clear on that. I know that in the law, those two boys, the first brother, who I think married Tamar, when he died, Tamar then had to go to the second brother to raise up seed. And that second brother did not want that. That's why God killed him, because he refused to give seed to his wife, to Tamar. And so they don't have to mow today, do they? Anyway. So, yet she is thy companion, the wife of thy covenant. And did he not make one? Yet had he the residue of the Spirit. And wherefore one? That he might seek a godly seed. So now God says in verse 15, halfway through, Therefore take heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. Husbands, boys, men, 
Do not deal treacherously with your wife. Do not go running around. Do not be out playing pool with the boys every night. Um, I've told you about the guy I worked with, played pool all night. His wife finally kicked him out. He wouldn't come home to his kids, wouldn't come home to his wife. She finally put him out, got tired of it. He came crying to me, and I said, I don't know if she'll take you back, but you're going to have to change your ways. So he came up with plan B. He met a girl at the pool hall who liked to go to the pool hall like he did, and that's who he ended up with. Plan B. So leave your wife, leave your children, run off with somebody else. That's what he did. Uh, years ago, and these people are not here anymore, so, but I'm not going to give their name. Years ago, there was a, a couple that came here, and not too long after they started here, they asked me, they said, can we, can we counsel with you one night? I said, sure. So they came in, and the wife said, uh, my husband, I believe he loves me, but he's got a woman where he works and I know that he has been to her house I know that he has given her money I know that he has helped her out and she said I, 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 that's all I know and I can't get any more out of him and so I said let me let me talk to him alone so she went out and sat down, and I just talked to him for a little bit. He claimed it was all honest. I don't know to this day whether it was, but I told him. I said, what you're doing, even if it's honest, it doesn't look right. And the world is watching, and your wife, when you're in somebody else's house alone with a woman, it does not look right. Can I get eight? It's that's old fashioned stuff. That's stuff nobody talks about anymore. Oh, that's, that's just how they did it back in the old days. No, this is God's way. This is God's way. Now, I want to tell you what. You can hurt your wife and do damage to her. And it may take years. Now the Lord redeemed that situation. If I told you how, you would know who it was. But the Lord did redeem that situation. And I'm glad that he did. Uh, the man took the advice... And said that he would just, he would stop doing that. He agreed that it didn't look right. He didn't say any more. Didn't tell me anything more. I didn't press him. And uh, I figured I'll just, if he's going to tell God about it, he can tell God about it. But I do know that the Lord redeemed that situation. So any, anyway, he says, Take the, heed therefore to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. For the Lord, the God of Israel, saith that he that hateth putting away. Now, Underline this verse in your Bible and make a note of it so you can turn to it one time. God does hate when married couples have to divorce. God hates it. He doesn't like it. He hates it. However, God himself did it. God himself did it. And you say, wherefore? I'll tell you. He that hateth putting away, for one covereth violence with his garment, saith the Lord of hosts. What did Adam and Eve do? Cover their sins with fig leaves. And that's what... Hey, everybody listen. Everybody online, listen. Some of you are used to covering your tracks on the internet. 
you're used to covering your tracks on the internet. So your wife don't find out, your mom and dad don't find out about it. Your wife don't find out about it. Nobody finds out about it. And you got pretty good at covering your tracks. But you forgot something. That God wrote it all down. And you cannot take a garment and cover that up. And do you think God will let you just get away with what you're doing? He never has. Be sure. Everybody say this with me. Be sure your sin will find you out. See how rhythmic that is? Be sure your sin will find you out. Get it, get it, Derek. Be sure your sin will find you out. For one covereth violence with his garment, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore, take heed to your spirit. You make this decision in your heart. You don't make it in your mind. You make it in your heart. I had a preacher tell me about his, uh, I was preaching a revival for him, and we were riding around, and he was telling me about a man that had an affair on his wife in the church. They were members of the church, and the man had an affair on his wife, and preacher went over to him and to deal with him about it and and the guy just said well he said it just happened he said I didn't know what I was doing it just it just happened and and I I didn't really wasn't even really thinking about it, it just happened like that and I told that preacher I said uh-uh no nah. I ain't buying it and he looked at me and I said and I told this preacher I said it takes a while for a married man to make up his mind to step out of his marriage for the first time. It takes a while. He looks at this woman. He longs for this woman. He gets this woman to start looking back at him. They start, that's, why, that's why Peter said having eyes full of adultery. You know what that is. It's that look. When you're out walking around and you look at a woman and that woman looks back and you catch eyes with each other. When that locks on and you don't turn away from that, when that locks on, that's an eyes full of adultery because what you're doing is you're both figuring out how we can get by with this. That's what that is, part of what that is. And I told this, told this preacher, I said, I do not believe that, I do not believe he just fell into that. I believe it took him months to finally get with that woman. He said, yeah, that makes sense. Because this preacher at that time was having an issue with his wife. And it was a serious issue. It wasn't infidelity or anything like that. She was just kind of a little nuts, to be honest with you. And uh, she was being a Jezebel in his own church. And he brought her to me. And they're both way older than me. He brought her to me. Want me to figure out what's wrong. And oh my goodness. Her mom listened to Joyce Meyer and she was all full of that stuff. And it was a mess. And I found out later that they went to Bob Tebow. Pastor down here. He's retired now, but he pastored down here at First Church in DeSoto. He went, he went to him for counseling with it. He still hadn't worked it out with his wife. But I, that man, I mean, he was a good looking man. I'm sure any woman in that town that he pastored probably could... You know what he did? He looked and talked like Bill Clinton. I'm not kidding you. Hey, hey, darling. You know, he didn't act like that, but he looked and talked like Bill Clinton. I teased him about it, but I told him, I said, it takes a while for a man to step out on his wife for the first time. And he agreed with that. That, that man did not just fall into that. Hosea chapter 2. Now watch this. This is, this is how God sees it. This is how God God who wrote the law. The law is holy. God has already said he hates putting away. He hates it. However, there is a line that cannot be crossed. There's always a line. Hosea chapter 2 verse 19. God makes a promise to Israel. You open your Bible up to this. You underline this. This is a promise. God said, and I will betroth thee unto me forever. Yea, 
I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment and in loving kindness and in mercy. Look at how many things, count Melissa, how many things he's going to betroth her unto him. Count them. Righteousness, judgment, loving kindness, mercies. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Jesus Christ. And I will even betroth thee unto me in faithfulness, and thou shalt know the Lord. That was God's offer to Israel. I'll be your husband. You'll be my wife. I'll give you, every, I'll give you the new Jerusalem. I'll give you my whole city. Beautiful city. Beautiful city. No, no, sit down, sit down. Let me finish preaching, okay? God wrote, watch this now. That promise was spoken by God and written in your Bible. Was it written down? It must be written down. Now, Deuteronomy 24. Here's the law that God gave when he said there's a line and I'm that's my language of it but God says there is a line that cannot be crossed Deuteronomy 24 when a man has taken a wife and married her and let me um, let me say this I heard a guy down at Bible camp when you're down at Niangua Lisa he was a fruitcake, man. He had some weird stuff. He was the guy that tried to get all the teens aside and teach them all his stuff. You remember that? He had this idea that once you slept with a woman, she was your wife right then. Is that true? If that's true, there's some guys out there that's got 158 wives. And he's going to pay them all. But that's not true. Not even in the Bible. I studied this out just not in depth, but just to get the gist of everything that God was saying about marriage. And God said, if an if a unbetrothed maid, a, a girl that had not been betrothed to anybody, she was not engaged to be married. And if a man took her and lied with her, He's not married to her yet. God then said the man had to marry her. He couldn't just use her for one night and toss her out and go about his life. God said, if you take that unbetrothed maid and lie with her, you must then afterwards marry her, legally marry her. See, there's a difference. And God said, you have to keep her forever. You have to keep her until you die. You can never put her away. That's God saying, tough on you for running around in town looking for young girls. We got a lot of perverts out there. Amen? Run around town looking for young girls. Well, God said, you see that maid out there. And you want, you want some of that, and you go into that, God said, you're going to marry that girl, you're going to pay the dowry, you're going to make her honest, and you are never allowed to put her away. You're, she's yours forever. Put up with it. And I guarantee you, God will make that girl mean as a wildcat. But he can't put her away. The law would not allow it. Moses would not allow it. So now, let's go back to this. When a man has taken a wife, and married her, and it come to pass that she find no favor in his eyes, because he had found some uncleanness in her. Then let him write her a bill of divorcement. It's written out, and give it in her hand, and send her out of his house. She went running around on him. She got on Facebook, got palled up with a bunch of guys, went chatting with them. Did FaceTime with them. Next thing you know, they're hooking up. And God said, 
you, you don't have to, but if you want to, you write her a bill, put her out. That's the law. Now, here's why God wrote that. Jeremiah 3, turn there. Because God himself had to do it with Israel. Had to. Jeremiah 3, 8. And I saw when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce. God did exactly what the law said. Yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not. In other words, Israel went whoring around the ten northern tribes. God wrote them a bill of divorce and sent the ten tribes up into Assyria. They were dispersed by the Assyrians and taken up into captivity and dispersed. Jew, that's why Jews lived all through Europe. From the time of Christ on, they had migrated all through Europe and had planted themselves in all these cities. And the only, only real means that they could have against their Gentile neighbors, because their Gentile neighbors were ruled by the Catholic Church and they were told to hate the Jews, despise the Jews, whatever. But the Jews then figured out banking. No kidding. And they got to where they were the creditors to all of the Gentile debtors. And the Gentiles didn't like that in a lot of places. And they persecuted the Jews so they wouldn't have to pay the bill. Hitler declared in one day that every Jewish bank account was to be seized and taken by the government. In one day. Every Jew in Hitler's domain, lost their money. And then, our American soldiers found out when they broke into some caves that the Jews that they gassed and killed and burned, they stole all their gold teeth. They had tons of gold teeth from dead Jews laying in caves, and that was Hitler's treasure. And that evidence came out at the Nuremberg trials. You ought to study those Nuremberg trials. Anybody tries to tell you there, that Holocaust didn't happen, go study Nuremberg. Because they brought it out in the trial. They showed the gold teeth that the German soldiers pulled out of all those Jews. But God put the ten tribes up. He wrote them a bill of divorce, sent them up to Assyria, then Judah should have said, uh-oh, well, we're not going to do that because uh, God will put us out. But that's not what they did. They were watching, and yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also. So what did God do? Sent them into Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar came and took them out. God wrote her bill of divorce too and said, you're out. God divorced Israel at that time and said, you can no longer be my wife. In the law, if you divorced a wife and years later you got back with her, you couldn't marry her. Could not marry her. Now there's a picture of the cross in this. The man that they were married to in the Old Testament, guess who it was? Jesus Christ. Because the law said that as long as her husband is alive, she cannot go out and be another man's husband. If he writes her a bill of divorce, she's out, and she can't remarry, and he can't remarry her. So what does he have to do in order to free her from the law? What does he have to do, Melissa? He has to die. And when Christ died, he now set Israel free. You read Romans 7. She is now free to marry another. Guess who the other is? Christ glorified. 
Amen. I heard, I had that idea in my mind, and I went down and heard Charlie Jameson preach it, and I went, he believes the same thing I do. Uh, I'm almost done here. Hosea 2.19, I will betroth thee unto me forever. This is God's new promise. I will betroth thee unto me forever. I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness and judgment and in loving kindness and mercies. And I will even betroth thee unto me in faithfulness and thou shalt know the Lord. We read that. And then in verse 23, he said, and I, watch this. this. This is who this is for now. Remember, we counted one, two, three, four. Betroth thee in righteousness, judgment, loving kindness and mercies. What was that about? You read on, you find out verse 23. And I will sow her unto me in the earth and I will have mercy upon her that had not obtained mercy. And I will say unto them, which are not my people, thou art my people. And they shall say, thou art my God. Who's he speaking of here? The Gentiles. We are not God's people. But he looks at us now and says, you are my people. And we say unto him, you are our God. Amen. I know there's a lot of questions on divorce, remarriage. I'll be honest with you, I don't have all the answers. I've studied it many times. I've listened to other people talk about it. They have various views that I do not agree with. I don't think the Bible speaks that. But it is clear to me that even in the New Testament, Christ himself gave a reason, a valid reason for divorce, and that was fornication. That's why I said this morning, it is the killer of any marriage. Fornication. It will destroy a man's love for his wife. This show I've been watching forensic files they were looking at a man for killing his wife or killing somebody and it was somebody he was supposed to be having an affair with well they went to the man and the man said I can't I'm old I can't do anything ask my wife so they talked to his wife and she said yeah he ain't touched me in a long time well only part of that was true he hadn't touched his wife because, first of all, he got into fornication the first time. And he liked it and he figured out he could get away with it. So he kept getting away with it. First with one and then another. And then he would have a girl call a friend of hers, bring her over. I'm talking wicked Wicked stuff. Things I'm not even supposed to talk about. That's why he wasn't touching his wife. And they found that out. They found out he was the killer. He lied. He was the guy. Be sure your sins will find you out, people. Amen? And young people, here and online, do what Lisa and I were taught in this church. Do not ever go out or date somebody that you would not marry. Do not do it. Am I right? Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. God gave me a gift in Lisa Leonard. I cried, I cried so much yesterday over my marriage, over my love for my wife. I cried all my tears out. I wailed. Got it out of my system so I wouldn't be a mess today. I liked it. I enjoyed it. It's right to be in love with your wife. And the first time she ever went out with me, not that we weren't on a date, we went on visitation together. 
went to visit Elsie Tuning. You remember that? You remember that? I do. And God was telling me, she's the one, Mike. Watch how she is on visitation. She's the one. We ain't been on visitation since. Not once, I don't think. <laughs> since we got married. But God was saying she's the one. Because even when I went astray on the Bible issue, she didn't. She didn't. She didn't want that NIV I bought her. She said, I don't like it. She just kept reading her King James. Mm-mm-mm. See, Chris, I'd have been stupid. It's, it's my wife going, you idiot, get back here to this King James Bible. Okay. Let's stand pray, all right? You young people, you listen to this old people. Tell you, don't do this stuff. Okay? My brother-in-law had seven wives. Not all at the same time. Thank God. My uncle Sonny had wives at the same time. He's in hell. But Steve had, Steve had seven, went through seven wives. They all kicked him out. I won't, I won't tell you anything else, but he was not a good person. Not until God reached down and saved him. Made him a different man. Father, we love you and we thank you, God. And Lord, if my brother-in-law were to come in here today and talk to everybody, he would tell them, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't run out on your wife. I did it. It brought nothing. Brought him nothing but despair and hopelessness. And he ended up with nothing. But he found you. And Father, I pray, dear God, you'd bless the young generation. They need guidance. Oh, Lord God, they need help. They're on the Internet constantly. And they got their face and their tablets and their phones. And they're talking to everybody. They're learning things, God, that they should never learn. Father, please help our young people today. Bless our marriages. Bless our homes, Father. Teach us how to live right, love one another, and love you, and bring honor and glory to the name of Jesus Christ forever. Bless your word tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, amen to that. You are dismissed.